Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our latest uh, INCAT presentation. Today we're going to be talking about the most common error messages in NASHTRAN. However, just before we get to that, I want to ask a couple of poll questions. First, how long have you been uh, doing simulations? We almost got all the votes in. Just a moment more. All right. Uh, let's let's see what we got here. Looks like a uh, majority of you have been at it for uh, less than a year, um, but and then after that, we're kind of split between one and three uh, three plus years. So next question. Oops. What did I, sorry, wrong button. There we go. <laughs> um, is INCAD your primary FEA simulation tool? Just a few more moments for all the votes to come in. Very evenly divided on that. Really close. Yes, we've got. Uh, we've got uh, 50, 57 percent of you uh, saying that Na uh, NAS training CAD is your primary. Another 43 percent that is uh, that you use other package packages. So, so make it interesting. Yes, indeed. <laughs> we ready to get started here? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so my name is James. I don't remember if I introduced myself. Bart here is going to be presenting mostly, and I'm going to be acting like the uh, antagonist here, trying to get squeeze out a little bit more information out of him. I would appreciate if you guys would ask questions in the question box. It helps me uh, uh, get more information out of Bart. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's the point here. We're we're here to challenge Bart. Uh, see what knowledge we can glean out of him. But so as most of you know, uh, this is our well our help webinar series. If you missed some of our past ones, we've got uh, working with constraints in INCAD. Uh, how to know you had a good mesh in NatStran. I did that one with uh, Andrew. I highly recommend it. Of course, not just because I did it, but. Anyways, we know you um, didn't mean that. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, um, as you know, we we have plenty. We have uh, resources where we post. Uh, this video will be on YouTube for your review later. Everything will be uploaded to a Box account for you to be able to download the model of this presentation too. So you could follow along um, at your own convenience. So uh, let's look at what's new in the news. So we have a hot fix out for NASHTRAD. Uh, I highly recommend, and highly recommend keeping your product up to date. Helps keep uh, those uh, bugs and unknown problems from getting into the way of your simulation. Uh, and slightly a bit older news, we do have self-paced training available on the website. Highly recommend going through it. It's uh, always a good base, a good start for those of you who are, who are in the uh, less than one year uh, range of uh, experience with it. And if we can get that next slide, uh, Bart, please. Okay. Thank you, sir. So uh, we are always expanding our knowledge base. Every time you contact us with an issue, if we don't have it already documented, we will document it for you. So. These are a list of some of our most recent articles we've created uh, regarding fatal errors, uh, deleting automatic geometry. You can find all this on knowledge.autodesk.com. You, you can follow the full URL there at the bottom, but you, you should be able to use the search on the website and find any sort of information that you're looking for. There's a good chance that we've uh, encountered it before. Very good so, chance. <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> very good chance. Um, and so with that, uh, Bart, shall I hand that over to you and uh, let's see what you've got for us today. Sure. We're going to talk today about some of the error messages that at tech support seem to come in a lot, people ask a lot, and I'll confess that whenever I build models in NCAD myself, I hit these all the time because I, I'm, I'm careless and I'm trying to do things too fast and I forget to hit the little buttons that I should be hitting. So we've identified five error messages that you've, you may or may not have seen, but some of them we've talked about before. Um, the first one is probably the number one error message we get. Error, fatal error 5004, stiffness matrix singular or non-positive definite. I'll talk quickly about what that means in a minute. Um, I've run into a lot of these T2135, unable to generate surface content. Yeah, what the heck does that mean and why would that come up? And there's sort of a limited number of situations where that comes up, but they, when they come up, you sort of look and go, what the? Uh, T2027 is an incompatible material uh, error. It's a fatal message. And there's another one that comes up a lot that says, uh, uh, let's see, what's well, inconsistent material. And I'll talk about both of those and where they come from and why you get them and what you do about them. Um, if you're like me, I run the job, I get the answers, and I have a zero solution. All the displacements and stresses are zero. And I sit down and start looking, going, why on earth? <laughs> what, did, what did I do wrong? Did I, you know, what did I do that gave me all zeros? Uh, and then there's the other one. Every time I go to do dynamics, I forget about just setting this up in the first place. And a little window pops up and says, no damping specified. And so, you know, what does it mean? What, is, what does it mean? How do you specify it? Do I need to specify it? So on and so forth. So this is what we're going to talk about. Let's get started. 5004, stiffness matrix singular or non-positive definite. It's probably the most common one that we, we get in Nastran. Autodesk Nastran comes in NCAD, comes in Nastran on its standalone. What it means, really, well, technically what it means is you've got a diagonal on your stiffness matrix. Um, and what it really means, though, from the point of view of a model, is that something is likely to be unattached. And when you have a zero on your diagonal, you have zero stiffness. So a finite load divided by a zero stiffness gives you an infinite displacement. So that's sort of a problem of doing it. And we'll talk about why you get this, this error. Um, the, the first and foremost is you forgot to constrain the model. And that's a really easy thing to do. Um, fortunately, NCAD usually picks that up, and I'll show you that in just a second. And another thing are improperly defined constraints, and I'll show you how you can get that one, even though you've defined the constraints. Uh, a one that actually is the cause of this quite an often is uh, improperly defined contact. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can improperly define contact, but the biggest way to improperly define it is to not give it a large enough activation distance. And also, it doesn't happen as much, but error 5004 is sometimes caused by singular elements in the model. And these are elements that are very, 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 very badly deformed. Uh, if you imagine a, a four-noted quad element, imagine that the four nodes aren't even remotely in the same plane. That's a very singular element. Um, I have had this come up with TET elements where the mid-side nodes aren't even remotely on the mid-side. So things like that will cause it. If you're meshing with an NCAD, it's not usually a problem because NCAD doesn't generate those bad elements. But let's take a look at a, uh, a 5004 error here. I have a little uh, model open here. And this is sort of your uh, classic uh, NCAD model. I've got two parts here, I've meshed the two parts, and they're pretty much attached together. And I can take this model and say, okay, I, uh, I'm going to run my job, and I'm going to say run it. And the first thing it says, I have no loads. And oh yeah, there it is. Down here in my model, I've got a load. Let's put our load up here. So now I've got a load. Okay, now I can run this job. And it says, oh, I don't have any constraints. Okay, that's the first thing. That will cause you the error if you don't have it, but let's put some constraints up here in the first place. So I've got some constraints up here. Um, often you can create things down in the model area, and they don't end up back in the actual analysis area. And that's sort of a common cause of a lot of these. Fortunately, NCAD is pretty good about 
giving you hints about that. So if I run this now, now it's ready to run, and it's going to run through, and lo and behold, error 5000, singularity detected. Basically, this is the same error as that 5004 one that's a non-positive definite. And I look at my model and say, you know, why am I getting this? Well, it could be any number of different things. If I look at my constraints over here, oh, look what I messed up on my constraints. I didn't have the X translation specified. So the whole model is free to move in the X direction. So let's fix that. I'll fix my constraint there. Say, OK, let's run the model again. And I chose a really bad mesh on a really small model to do this. Oh, I've still got a singularity. I've still got this 5,000 or non-positive definite or something. And now I think about it and say, OK, I've constrained this piece over here. It's not going to move anywhere. But this one is not attached. So how am I going to attach those together? Well, I can do it in Inventor and make them one piece and do anything. But an easier way is to do a contact. So I'm going to do a simple contact. I'm going to take automatic, and I'm just going to say OK, and let it generate it, and run my job again, and see if I get this singularity. Oh, unable to generate surface contact. Hey, that's a message we're going to talk about in a little later. Let's, uh, let's see what we did on our contact and why we might have gotten that message. If I go back to my contact here, I'm taking all the defaults here. I'm saying I've got automatic contact and I've specified no tolerance. So it's going to use a very, very small tolerance to create this. Um, in order to get rid of that error message, I need to create a tolerance down here. Let's do a tolerance of, say, 0.1 inches, because these aren't all that far apart, I don't think. So I'll say OK. Let's see if I can get the job to run again. Oh, it's unable to generate surface contact still. OK, well, let's try something different. When I have situations where my surface contact isn't generating very well, I like to connect them explicitly. So I'm going to go and I'm going to specify my contact regions directly. I'm going to pick this face here, and I'm going to pick the face over here. And if I measure this little gap here, this gap's about 0.07. So if I set my um, activation distance here at about eh, 0.1, let's say, it'll generate a pretty good job here. And it ought to be able to do this and generate my contact without giving me any fatal errors. Hey, look at that. There we are. We're running. No singularities, no non-positive definites, basically no zeros on my, uh, my diagonal. I get out here. And it comes out and has finished the job. And let's uh, go back and see what the results look like. There we go. That looks about right to me. Now, Bart, I got a yeah. question for you then. Sure. What about, what about a model that is, you know, not necessarily fully constrained, like you don't have every degree of freedom constrained, but technically it should be statically stable. If you were doing like a free body diagram, you're, you've got equal and opposite forces opposing each other. Good question. And in theory, from a, from a theory point of view, you're not applying a load in any direction, and therefore it ought to work just fine that way. And mm -hmm. you run into this a lot with like airplanes. You have weight down, uh, you have weight pushing down, you have uh, aerodynamic forces lifting you up. And you have it with ships, too. You have hydrostatics pushing you up, weight pushing you down. It's in balance. Do I have to constrain it? And the answer is, from a finite element point of view, because there's no stiffness in that direction, it's technically a zero on the diagonal. And sometimes you can get away with it, and it'll run just fine. And if it runs just fine, that's great. On the other hand, Often it doesn't run just fine, and you get this non-positive definite error. And the reason that often comes is because in the numerical world on a computer, zeros are rarely zero. 
So even though the free body diagram, you've assigned it a value of zero force, often if you have some forces that aren't normal to the surface being resolved, you'll end up with them in a, uh, you'll end up with a numerical 10 to the minus 14th. And as much as you'd like to think otherwise, 10 to the minus 14th divided by zero is still infinity. And so if you have one of these that isn't constrained, in a direction, even though you're not loading it, you still end up with, uh, you, you can still end up with infinite displacements and good old error message 5004, <laughs> non-positive definite. So you pretty much always need to have somewhere somehow uh, constrained in order to take care of that very, very small, I, I would call it like a rounding error. Absolutely. In the, in, in a direction that you don't have constraint. Yep, an alternate that you can use, if you've got a model that isn't constrained at all, for instance, an airplane or a ship, mm -hmm. there's something we have called inertia relief, and it's down here under the parameters down from the bottom menu, and I believe it is in the solution processors, and it's called inertia relief here, and if mm -hmm. I turn that on to auto, what it's gonna do is it's going to look at my model and find all the forces that are unbalanced, however minuscule they are, and it is going to balance them so that they absolutely are completely balanced, and then it's going to pick a point and it's going to constrain it so that when you run it, the constraint force will be zero, but you won't have a zero on the, fact, on the diagonal because you technically have a constraint there. And so that's good for things like airplanes, boats, things that are floating in space. Is that, is that like a hard constraint, or is that more like just a soft spring? It's a soft spring. It's a soft okay, spring, wonderful. but it never actually really has any load in it because it balances the forces for you. So that's a very useful, uh, a useful tool for things like that. I, I really like that one. Um, you can set up the, the, uh, the hard, you can pick a point yourself using inertia relief on, or you can use auto, which I prefer, which just finds a point and constrains it for you. It's really all arbitrary. You ah, get the great. same answers both ways. Thank you, sir. Let's go back over here, see if I can go back to full menu. Okay, so if you've got uh, this 5004 or the 5000 error, it means something's flying away. So to resolve it, check the constraints. We had our, our first one, I didn't have any constraints at all. Then I went back and had the wrong constraints and I was letting it free in one direction and then I was still getting the error because my contact settings were bad and then it ran for me so I didn't have to get down to this last one. This last one is an element quality check and you can do that in NCAD a number of ways and basically it looks for elements that are highly badly badly deformed. The other way you can do it is when the analysis runs it'll give you a lot of uh, messages, warning messages sometimes, that come up that say element has a skew angle that's too high or element has an aspect ratio too high. But if you look at the output, and that would be over here, um, after I've run the job, I can go look at my Nashtran output here. And you can sort of flip through and see these red messages and what it's looking at. And it'll give you a summary of the error messages at the bottom. And it'll also give you a number of error messages you know, it's hard to create a solid mesh that's perfect. And you'll, always, you'll almost always get some kind of little errors, messages, some elephants, elements here or there that are messed up. And if you look through, and because you're getting these singular messages and you've already done all the other checks on it, one of the things that you probably want to do is look through those messages a little more closely and look for the word singular. Or, you know, element such and such has singular geometry is a message. Another message that you might see is unable to determine orientation of elements such and such. Um, that often means that you have a quad element that all four nodes are on a line. So it's not really a quad, it's a line. Um, it happens with triangles all the time. You get with triangles that are on the line. Um, if you're meshing with NCAD, you're probably not gonna run into those. But if you have somebody else's model and you're running it, or somebody else has played around with the model, that's where you get these element quality problems. So let's move on 
T2135, unable to generate surface contact using specified parameters. Well, we saw that already. I uh, managed to uh, muck that one up on my first example. Um, basically, that occurs when you're doing manual or automatic contact and your gap is too large. Do I have a little thing here? Yeah. Because, oops, when I go off to my model here, if I go into my little gap down here and look at my gap down here, I can measure this gap using, uh, uh, where is it, it's under tools over here. I can measure my distance of the gap and I'll find that my distance of this gap is like 0 0.07 inches. So when I create my contact back here in my model, where is my contact? My surface contact is right here. If I create my surface contact, I put my activation distance at 0.1 here. If I set my activation distance of like 0.05, it will generate that error message because with the two surfaces I've specified, there are no points on those two surfaces that are within 0.05 inches of each other. So it's necessary to set this a little bit higher. So actually, if I set this this way and go back over into NCAD and run it, I'll get that message that it could not, it was unable to generate it. So that's a not unusual, oh yeah, it generates a singularity and uh, it's a singular because it's not trying to run, but it'll, depending on how they build that, it'll uh, generate that error. Okay, let me, uh, let me remove that one and let me remove that one because those are ones we were mucking around with and see if this one gives me that T2135. Probably will. Now, question for you, Bart. Is there, would you say there's a rule of thumb of how much larger you should set your activation distance than the gap? Is um, it mesh dependent? It isn't really mesh dependent, but it's not entirely mesh independent either. Um, I, I tend to set it, unless I have another reason to do it, I tend to set it about twice the gap. What I don't want to do in a case like this is if my gap is 0.05 and my elements are 0.25, I don't mm -hmm. want to set so big that it thinks this element, this node back out here, is in contact with this one. So okay. I want it in the order of magnitude in the gap, but not way, way bigger. Now sometimes it has to, sometimes you have to do it. I'm not sure there's a massive penalty. Um, if I'm specifying these two surfaces, like I did for this contact, where I picked two surfaces, if I'm specifying mm -hmm. the two surfaces, it's not going to look elsewhere. It's not going to look for other points. But if I'm using one of the uh, um, automatic contacts where I haven't specified the surfaces, then I've got a problem. Because yes. it's searching well, one whole part to the other whole part. Exactly. Exactly. And if you if you specify it too big and everything there, it's going to get too much. So you sort of want to keep mm -hmm. it. You sort of want to keep it in the range of your gap. Um, you know, if you measure the gap and it's 0.071, and you might get 0.072, if it's all perfectly flat, it'll probably work. <laughs> if it's not quite <laughs> flat, there might be some that are 0.073 apart. So, so it might up, be like be. Par partially connected and you'll get yes r weird results absolutely absolutely and we saw let me let me uh, rerun this since I fixed my contact back up again here uh, but often the uh, that activation distance and the tolerance are often what govern bad contact if they're too small it doesn't work or it doesn't completely engage and you end up with these singularities and you end up with cannot generate contact and stuff and he was doing, uh, giving me a little iteration thing there that I'm not going to talk about now, but that's uh, that's something else. Um, did I run that? Yeah, so I can go back, yeah. And you can see from my von Mises stresses here, it's a pretty uniform across this joint here. And that tells me that it's, you know, I did a pretty good job getting it. Um, you know, it, it tells me that the contact surface is fully engaged because it's a smooth smooth uh, color across the contact joint, pretty much. Yeah, okay. Let's go on here. I'm going to make this full screen again. There we are. Okay. Yeah, so resolve it. You're checking the contact settings and mostly the activation distance. Um, occasionally, I find with, with NCAT, I'll pick, a, uh, I'll pick two edges instead of the faces, 
and you can look in your contact and say, oh, shoot, I connected two edges instead of two faces, and that sometimes creates that problem. In fact, last night when I was putting this together, I was having a devil of a time picking that one edge until I zoomed way in like that, or one face, and so I kept getting edges, and it wasn't sticking together, and it gave me piano hinges that were singular and gave me <laughs> singular items, and it was like, ah, i got to pick that face. So that always works. So that works pretty good. Okay, let's nice clicks. Got They're always fun. Yes. Next here, Fatal Error 2027, and this says an entry references a non-compatible material. And if I were to go back to my, my model here, let's go to my model here. Whoops, wrong one. Let's go to my model and say, instead of using alloy steel, which I've made this out of, let's say I want to create a new material here. And my new material, I want to call it a, a 2D orthotropic material because it's a laminated composite. So I'm going to put an E in of a 100,000 and uh, 90,000 and um, let's take this 50,000. I'm uh, 50,000. I'm making up numbers here, but 45,000. Okay, those are what I need. A Poisson. I've got EG new. Let's call this uh, 2D, 2D ortho. Okay, 2D ortho. Okay, good enough. And I can go back to my physical property up here, and I'm going to edit my property. And instead of alloy steel, I'm going to make it out of my 2D orthotropics. And since my whole thing consists of two of them, I'm going to edit this one and change it to my 2D orthotropic and say, awesome, it's a laminated composite. It's a 2D orthotropic. I go to run this. And it comes up, and what does it do? It says, Entity references a non-compatible material. Well, when I go back and think about this, these are solid elements. And solid elements aren't going to work with a 2D orthotropic material. Um, a 2D orthometropic material has no properties in the out-of-plane dimension, so the 3D, has, has, the 3D elements have nothing to do with. So if I really wanted to make this work, what I'd have to do is change this to a uh, orthotropic 3D material. And now I've got E1, E2, E3 up here. So now I can put in some other things, like I get 90,000 up here. And I have no idea what I'm going to get for answers. And then you need your Poisson ratios over here for a 3D. And this lets you do orthotropic 3D materials. And um, I'll, I'll just present a warning that we ask for new 1, 2, new 2, 3, and new 1-3. And in that order, they're all going to be about the same size. Often you'll get data where they give you new 3-1, which is a very, very small number. <laughs> and uh, confusing the two is a problem. But that's a 3D orthotropic, and that lets you do, do fancier stuff. I change that. I won't get this, this, this error message. So I'm going to go back, and uh, I'm going to leave that for now. OK. Let's go back over here to presentation. So the resolve resolution for that is just use a 3D orthotropic material. Um, there's another uh, partner warning message, I'll call it, that says it's T2061. It's uh, simply a warning message, and it says unreasonable material data. And you can ignore it sometimes, um, but we generally recommend deleting the G value. And I'll tell you why this happens. If I were to go into my model here, and tell it, no, 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 I didn't mean to make it out of alloy steel. I meant to make it out of some other material. Let's call it, uh, how about ABS? It was ABS plastic. I'll close that out, and I'll say, awesome, I've got an ABS plastic model. I'm going to go change this and edit it and change it to my uh, ABS. Um, you may have not have known that, um, what is it? Uh, Acronitrile butadiene styrene is ABS plastic. I learned that. New to me, too. New to me, yep. I, someone was telling me it was ABS, and they picked it out of our material library, and it was like, huh? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to run this again, and run, 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 and it should come out with, oh, it didn't. Oh, okay. Uh oh. Uh, it didn't come out with it with ABS. Okay, I'll tell you why. The reason is it's supposed to break. It's supposed to break. Yeah. Here, let's do this. Let's uh, yeah, let's uh, let's go back to my uh, ABS here. And what it's telling you is 
if I calculate, oh, there's why it's got a big new value. In uh, any material, once I tell it it's isotropic over here, isotropic materials have to maintain a relationship that G is equal to E over 2 times 1 plus nu. And if that is true, Nash Tran will run and do fine. However, if I change this material over here to this alloy steel that I get out of the database, if you look at it, the value here is 2.9, the value is 0.3, and if I calculate my actual G value, it's probably going to be about 1 by 0.6. So if I use that material and make that one, uh, uh, make, that, make one of these made out of that, that's always good. Oh, it's already done it. Let's make it out of this one instead. Okay. And let's make this one out of that one instead. Okay. And now it better break this time. There we go. Unreasonable material data. And what that simply means is that G is not equal to approximately E over 2 times 1 point plus nu. So if I want to get rid of that error message, the surest way to do it is to delete the G value. So I can go back into my material over here, where's my, my, my second alloy steel, and delete the G value and say, OK, and run the job, and it's not going to give me this error anymore. OK, awesome. No more error. Warning. Um, some finite element codes actually will take the step when you run them of uh, taking your data and saying, I'm going to ignore your G value because you put in one that's inconsistent. Nashtran does not do that inside of NCAD. Inside, oh, there we finished. Inside of NCAD, what Nashtran does is it says, well, it's unreasonable, but I'm going to use it anyway. And as long as you're close, that's probably not a big deal. But sometimes it's not. Um, some of the steel materials in the Autodesk database, there's one of them that has an E value of like 200,000, and the G value is like 8,000. It's not even close to being an isotropic number. I don't know why it's, why it's inconsistent, but in those situations, I wouldn't ignore it. I, would, I generally de delete G when I'm using those. I only put in E and nu because they're usually right and G may or may not be. So, so what you're suggesting, Bart, is that uh, it checks the G value, but if you have no G value, it'll just automatically calculate it for you? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. And if you put one in, it looks at what you've had to see if it's what it would calculate. And if it's not what you would calculate, it gives you this warning message, but it uses what you gave it anyway. And let me tell you, if you have a really, really bad G value, you can get some really strange answers. But the reason we do this is Nashtran uh, is, a, is a great code. Uh, People have year for years have faked Nashtran to do things it was never intended to do. And if you want to turn a solid into an acoustic solid element, you put a G value in of 10 to the minus 20th and a Poisson ratio of 10 to the 20th. And you know what? It turns into an absolutely awesome acoustic element. But <laughs> E and G and nu are not consistent. So mm -hmm. just something you can fake Nashtran to do all sorts of stuff. And so we let you fake it if you want, but. <laughs> we don't recommend that. Now, sometimes though, so when you're when you're referring to being able to ignore it, sometimes those, t those times that you can ignore it, um, especially if you believe you put in the right value, or, or you did put in the right value. You're probably um, okay. It's probably okay. just off by one percent or a half a percent, and I don't know what the tolerance on it is, but it's not a lot of tolerance. So if it should be 46,000 and you put in 46,105, it may tell you it's inconsistent and you did the hand calc and you know that it's pretty darn close. And, and that's okay. not going to affect you at all. <laughs> and Wonderful. that ABS one was obviously close enough because it didn't crash for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another one that I get. <laughs> a zero solution. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of reasons you can get a zero solution. Um, one of the, the classic ones is a lack of loads. Um, when I started to run this, I put in a load and I didn't have a load. Fortunately, NCAD comes up and instead of giving me an error, it says, hey, I can't write the NASTRAN deck because you have no loads. 
okay, fine, have no loads. Um, another way is you can over-constrain the model, and I'll show you an example of both a lack of loads that does run and give you this error and an over-constrained. The other one, if you remember back from that non-positive definite, occasionally you'll have a badly singular element, and again, badly singular elements do some really weird things, but they always produce error messages. And I had discovered one time that I have a quad element that had three of the nodes were in a straight line, so it was really a triangle. And it ran, it didn't give me a singularity, but I got no results out of my analysis. And I looked through my results and found this element that had an internal angle of 180 degrees. I fixed it, and lo and behold, I got answers. So let me, let's just look quick at the uh, at a couple of the things that we can get with a zero solution. I already showed you if I go up here and remove my load here and say run, it tells me I can't do it because I have no loads. That's obvious, that comes out. I like this, I can drag my load back up here and put it here. Now if I go into my load and put in a pressure of zero here, I can say okay, and I can run my job, and it's gonna run all the way through, and I'm gonna get all these great answers and it's going to tell me that my maximum principal stress is zero, my stresses are zero, and I plot my von Mises plot here and it doesn't draw the spectrum on the side. Well that is a clear indication of the problem. So that's a zero result. So hey, that's what we got. Um, and that's because I did it. The other thing that will happen on this is I can take this model and I can add some constraints over here. I can add some constraints and say, well, I want to look at the shear and the elements, so I'm going to constrain the top here and the top there, and I'm going to constrain the bottom here and the bottom here, and say, okay, great, and I'm going to run this analysis, and I'm thinking that these elements are going to shear because I'm constrained. I think it's going to run okay because I'm constraining them, but it doesn't run okay because it doesn't really constrain it, because it's constraining everything on the whole model. Sorry, there we are. Okay, sorry, dropped the headphones there. Am I still uh, able to be heard? Yes, sir. Okay, good. These headphones fall off my head sometimes. Okay, so that's a, and, you, and again, I plot my von Mises stresses. They all come out blue. There's no spectrum, and that's almost always an indication that Either I over-constrained it, put too many things in, or I did otherwise. Um, looks like I'm running behind. Let me uh, quickly sort of go on to this last little error message here. Um, let's get it into a full screen here. There we go. I go to run a dynamic analysis, and I click on my button and I say run the job and it pops up and says Nastran file cannot be created due to the following errors. Structural damping requires a damping value, blah, 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 blah. It didn't do it. What on earth does that mean? Well, when you do a dynamic analysis, Nastran in CAD will automatically populate you with a form that looks like this one on the left. And the key thing on this is, is that all these boxes are empty. And right up here where the little arrow is, you can see structural damping is checked. So what it's doing is saying, you should have damping, but I'm not going to pretend to give tell you what it is. And so to get rid of this error, you can either run the job without damping, which isn't generally a good idea, and you can do that by unchecking the box over here. Or what's probably more important is to actually put in some damping. And generally, if you're running a frequency response analysis, all you have to do is put in the uh, damping value here, and it uses that damping value across all the frequencies. If you're running a transient analysis, you need to put in a dominant frequency down here. And the reason for that, and I'll be very quick about this, is that structural damping in a transient analysis works like this. At high frequencies, you have in infinite frequencies, you have infinite damping. At zero frequency, you have zero damping. And you're triangulating and putting a point and saying at the W3 point, I have a frequency, I have a damping value equal to G. And by putting that in, it's establishing the slope of this line. So again, 
people ask me, what should I use for W3? Generally, if your structure is vibrating at some frequency or some frequency is important or you've measured damping and you know what the damping is, that's what you'd put in for W3 and put in G. Damping is sort of a, a wild card when it comes to uh, finite elements and, and structures in general because it's hard to measure and it's hard to do much with. So you either define the damping value in the dominant frequency or you uncheck the box. That's how you get rid of that. <laughs> so it gets me every Pretty time because I always forget. Yes, I always forget. So these are what we talked about. Singular matrix, unable to generate surface contact. Um, singularity detected was the 5001 up there also. Uh, and T2027, incompatible material and its partner, unreasonable material properties. Some things that might cause zero solutions and this no damping specified error. So with that, we will open it up to any questions people might have on any yes, topic. Yes, please, uh, type up your <laughs> questions. We don't have currently any uh, listed, so we appreciate any questions to challenge Bart here. The chance <laughs> to uh, pick his brain. They don't, don't even have to easy. And they don't even have to be on the relevant topic. You can uh, try to stump me with anything. Of course, if yes. I don't know, I'll, tell, I'll get James to fill it in for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about, since damping is such a royal pain while we, while we fill in for yeah. people. Let Please me, uh, type up some questions. While he, Bart, Bart's got something here you could talk about. Yeah. Um, the damping, damping in Nastran, like I said, people ask about it all the time. And... Let's go back to the beginning of my thing. There's lots of these buttons on this form, and the question always becomes, what all do they mean? And I already showed what the G and the W3 means. Um, NASTRAN, the damping matrix, is this monster equation down here that has a factor times a B1 matrix, which are elements that you put in, like springs and dash pots. Then it has our global stiffness matrix and the G and the W3 that we already talked about that puts global damping on the model. Then it adds in damping which is material specific. The E is element stiffness matrix. So I can put damping that only applies to certain elements and it gets added into the damping stiffness matrix too. And then over on the other side of the form there was something called rally damping and rally damping consists of a mass proportional portion and a stiffness proportional portion. And so these all get added together in damping. Structural damping we saw if you have independent material it gets added together so I have global damping, element damping gives me the total damping on those elements. I showed you how G and W3 works. W4 works exactly the same way but only for a particular material. Uh, rally damping has a mass proportional part that decreases with frequency and a stiffness proportional that increases with frequency. So the stiffness proportional looks a lot like the normal damping and the mass proportional is this, this downward one that I couldn't draw very well because I'm not very good with PowerPoint. And it'll generate a curve overall that has some finite value at low values and so it's damped well at low values but it's also damped well at high values and has a vaguely linear in here. You can also put springs and dampers in, and those are, you know, if I can add a create connector element, that's a, a damping element I can turn it on. Those are explicitly put in there. When I'm running dynamic solutions, I have the option of doing a direct solution, which solves the equations of motion directly. The other way I can do it is a modal solution, which is a modal superposition. And when I do that, I do a modal analysis and then I add up all the different mode shapes to get my answer. And it's a really great way to do it because it's really fast, but it messes up all the damping. So Nastran has something called modal damping down here. In the modal damping, you can either put in a constant value or you can put in a percent of critical or you can put in a table that defines your damping as a function of frequency. So those are what you got. Those are the damping values. And then of course people ask me what's a good value? And honestly, I'm going to skip through some of these. Honestly, 
there's no good answer to that. There's no good guide. It's hard to do tests. Metal structures tend to be damped 2 to 4% of critical. Um, bolted and joints and welded structures tend to be higher. Single pieces are a little lower. Plastics and composites, 8 to 12%. Woods in that area. But again, single layers, low unidirectionals are lower. Sandwiches and layups tend to be higher. But again, these are really, really general numbers. They're, they're, they're really general. <laughs> so I would never believe them. So unless you know better, you know, pick 4% or 10% if you're doing composites. Um, there's no good guesses that are generally applicable, and that's about what you can do. And there isn't a whole lot you can do with it if you don't know it. But if you know it, you're doing better than anyone else. <laughs> you've been doing better than a lot of people. Got right. Well, there? I got some questions for you, Bart. Yes, I do. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, one question uh, is: Is damping necessary for a modal analysis? And on that same, uh, um, off of that same question, is damping available for both the for for both uh, direct integration and modal superposition? Yeah, for modal superposition and direct solutions, damping is available for both ones. Um, they're not exactly the same, and you have to muck around in order. If you have 2% of critical, it's sort of hard to muck around to get 2% of critical for both solutions because they do it in a different way and they do the modal conversion. But generally, the modal damping we use for the modal superposition methods because they it's a very efficient way to do the damping. If you use structural damping, which you can do, it creates a, a non-diagonal uh, damping matrix, which takes a lot longer to solve. For small models, it may not be important. For large models, it could be critical. Um, but again, all of these types of damping are available for all solutions, types of those. Um, let's see, there was another, I was thinking something that I was not thinking of. Oh, do you have to have it? Um, the answer is no. Um, damping does two things for you. Um, the primary one is it adds stability to the solution. So if you don't have any dynamic, any damping in a transient solution, often you'll hit something and you'll see it bouncing around and it'll shake and shake and shake and shake forever and ever and ever. And contact has a tendency, if you have contact bumping into things in a transient solution, without damping, you'll watch the contact force and it'll it'll go up and then it'll go zero and then it'll go up and go zero and go up and go zero and it takes a very long time to get things to mate in contact if there's not some kind of damping slowing the vibration down. But it's not necessary. It'll run without it, just may look funny. Um, the only other place where it is required is if you're doing an enforced vibration with a frequency response or a harmonic vibration analysis. If you pick a frequency that happens to be exactly the natural frequency, you'll get a resonance and you'll get an infinite response and Nashtran will crash with an unreasonable response type error. So if you are choosing your natural frequency as an excitation frequency, then you need some kind of damping to keep the peak from being infinite. So that's really the only time it's absolutely required. Otherwise, it's just useful. <laughs> Thanks, Bart. One more question right now. Uh, how can one add natural frequency from a damper to Nashtran? That is using a connector. And so if I have a connector element, let's go back here to my model here. Um, I'm not going to add one, but I'll show you how to add it. If I actually have a damper, for instance, I have a damper that's connected to the end of this so that when it vibrates, the damper keeps it from, from moving too much. I can do that by creating a connector down here. And let's create a new connector. And if I tell it it is a spring connector, it'll ask me for two points, two endpoints, end A, end B. And if I click on stiffness, it creates a spring element. If I click on damping, it creates a damper element. And this is just a plain old dash pot, and these are the C values that would uh, be used for a dash pot for damping. So that lets you directly create a, a 
explicitly created damping element. Um, it's a little hidden here because it's a spring and you have to check damping, but that's how you do it. So B1, B2, B3, et cetera, those are the degrees of freedom, I assume. Yeah. Oh, and that's a good point here. Those are the degrees of freedom, and they are the degrees of freedom in the element coordinate system. And so in my model here, if I create a spring that goes up in this direction in the Y direction, B1 is the damping in the Y direction for that element because the element coordinate system is in that direction. And then two and three are perpendicular to that, and then four, five, six are, are rotational. So B4 here is the a torsional damping about the element axis. Um, I always forget that when I build spring connectors. I'm thinking K1 is in the X direction and K2 is in the Y direction, but they're in the element coordinate system unless I've told it otherwise which I can do right here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we've, we're kind of out of questions, unless anybody has any at the last moment here. Uh, we still got some time for questions. And I'll just say, every one of these error messages I run into myself, because a lot of them come up when I'm, when I'm careless and I forget to do something right, and they get to be old friends. <laughs> you, you run the model and you go non-positive definite and you immediately go, oh, that's right, I forgot to put my contact in. Oh, I forgot to put the distance on it. Oh, I forgot this, I forgot that. It's, you, they get to be old friends and if you're careless, you see your old friends a lot more than you should. Um, which probably says something bad about me, but um. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't argue with that. I do that a lot myself either, because uh, you know I just forget something. I'm thinking about the end goal, and I know what I need to do to get there, but uh, you know I'll turn something on and forget to define this, or think I've already got everything set up, and it's like, all right, run it. It's like, oh, what did I do? Oh, okay, yes. Oops. <laughs> yeah. After you, after doing this for so long, I still do that. Always. Yes. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I had had a uh, um, in the olden days, way way back when people did timeshares on computers, submitting your job may cost you a hundred dollars to submit it. So you wanted to sit down and look at all your data before you put it in, and make sure it was right before you spent the money to submit it. Nowadays, mm -hmm. Nashtran debugs it a lot cheaper and faster than I can debug my model. <laughs> so, in I can look it over for an hour and check it and make sure it's right, or I could submit it and go, oh, non-positive definite, darn, and fix it in two twenty seconds. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, one, we got one last question. Uh, can you so back to those uh, dash pots, those springs? When you create them. How do you know the the other two uh, axes, the, the other two element axes? Is there a way to display that? Ah, uh, I don't believe there is a way to display it, but there may be a way. When you create it, you generally give it a coordinate system. Let's see. I can oh, tell. Okay. It, yeah, I can. What I can do is let's say. Uh, this is a stumper. Um, actually, what you're doing is um, it looks like we are creating them only in a global coordinate system. So these are the coordinate systems that are available for this element. Mm -hmm. And so that would be K1, K2 would be in the global system if we're using these. So those mm -hmm. are the other two coordinate systems. Um, I'm thinking, I'm back, I'm thinking Nashtran. These would be in the element coordinate system unless you specify a coordinate system here, in which case it's in this coordinate system. So this sort of makes it easy for you. Um, it lets you, lets you do it that way. I would have to, let me, I might have to get back and write a little uh, note on this, how this does this. Because right. uh, 
Yeah, because this is a good, that's a good question because um, the way it's set up, it's always going to do it in one of these coordinate systems and then one through six are in one of these coordinate systems. And I don't appear to have an option to use my element coordinate system. But okay. I, will find, I will find that out. That's a good, good, good that question. That would be great. That would be, that's a good question. All right. We stumped him. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. Right at the end, we managed to stump him. It's great. Uh, so I think at this point, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us. Uh, remember that you can, uh, this video will be available on our YouTube uh, website, Autodesk Sim 360. And the, both this presentation, the PowerPoint here, uh, and the example model file will be available on our Box account right there at the URL down below, autodesk.box.com forward slash Nashtran in CAD IQ. Uh, once again, thank you everybody and have a good day.